if I was to ask you all to name for me 10 women from the Indian independence struggle, how many of you are going to be able to do that without referring to Google or the help of a textbook? Let me flip that question a bit. If I was to ask you all to name for me 10 men from the Indian independence struggle, how many of you are going to be able to rattle off the names at the tip of your fingers? My name is Kirti Jayakumar, and I am here to talk about my quest for truth. The year was 2001, and I was a 13-year-old girl sitting in class 9. If you're doing a mental calculation of my age, hold on. Stick with my thought. This is more important. I sat in my history class as my teacher was giving us assignments, topics that we had to write 1,000 word reports on. I went to an ICSE school where 80% of your grade came from the exams you wrote and 20% of your grade came from the projects that you put together. So this was serious business. We were 39 of us in our class, 21 of us girls, 18 of them boys. I waited with bated breath. I was roll number 16. My teacher rattled off names. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi, Adolf Hitler, Winston Churchill, Benito Mussolini, you had it. It was on that list. When it came to my name, she had allotted me Dag Hamashkold, the former Secretary General of the United Nations. I was delighted at her thoughtfulness because she was giving me a leader that I once wanted to emulate at some point in the future by joining the UN. But even as I wrote down his name at the back of my notebook for recall later, I felt uncomfortable, but I didn't know why. I continued listening to the rest of the names, and by the end of the list, I think I understood why I was uncomfortable. 39 leaders for 39 students, but 37 of those leaders were male. Just two were female. Indira Gandhi and Rani Lakshmi Bai, or who we all know as the Rani of Jhansi. When the bell rang and my teacher left the class, I followed her all the way to the staff room. When I stopped her and I asked her if I could change the name of the leader that was allotted to me, she was surprised and also a little uncomfortable because if she allowed one student to do that, heaven knows there could be more asking her for that favor. And yet she asked me why I wanted to do it, choosing to engage with me instead of dismissing me altogether. And I told her, ma'am, I want to write about a woman leader. She smiled at me and told me that I could do that. But if I could find the name of a leader myself, one with enough information for a ninth grader to write a thousand word report on and report back to her the next morning with the name. Challenge accepted. I ran to the library by the end of the day, looked up book after book after book, set aside for students of grade nine. And I was shocked at what I found. I found the very two names that were allotted to my class. One had one sentence, Indira Gandhi, the first woman to be the Prime Minister of India. The other name had a paragraph, Rani of Jhansi. But men, you see, men, they popped up at you with almost every line. And some had chapters, some had three chapters, and it was shocking that women were invisible. At that moment, I wondered if I was being scammed. I mean, were there no women in history? Or was I not being told something? Nevertheless, I persisted. You see, at that time, research was not like student research as it is today, which is Google and Wikipedia. Back then, you had to throw yourself into your textbooks. And I really hope some of us are still doing that. By the next morning, with black circles under my eyes and a sense of desperation in my heart, I had the name. And I went to my teacher and said I wanted to write about Margaret Thatcher. She smiled said that I had her approval, and she told me that she had made a very, very important decision that day, one that she would hope would come back as knowledge to me in the future. As every other 13-year-old, the project was done, was submitted, and forgotten. 
with the question that she left me with. The question that the both of us shared that morning came back to haunt me in November last year. You see, in November last year, I found myself staring an article in the eye that talked about how the Central Board for Secondary Education had decided to do away with a chapter that talked about the struggle of women and caste in Indian history. The said chapter chronicled the narrative of a woman by the name Nangeli. You see, she belonged to a community in this very land that I stand and speak to you today, called the Yerava community, which was deprived of the privilege of wearing an upper cloth. And if a woman at the time had to wear an upper cloth, she had to pay a tax to be able to do that. But Nangeli would have none of it. She believed she had the inherent right to decide what she wanted to wear. And so she went ahead and did just that. But the person in charge of collecting taxes would have none of it either. And so in the ensuing battle, she cut off her breasts and presented it on a plantain leaf to the collector, her act of resistance. Now the erasure of that chapter made me realize that my 13-year-old self had been walking without an answer. And along with me, the rest of the world. Because you see, the erasure of women in history is not a joke. It's not something to be taken lightly. Women have made the world what it is, and we haven't given them their due by acknowledging them for what they've done and for all their many contributions that make life convenient even today. And doing that has two terrible risks attached to it. Number one, we allow our girls and women to grow into a generation of the future without role models to look up to. Number two, we also silently tell our girls that no matter what it is that they do, they will be elbowed out of their history books. Because you see, it's history. No room for her story. Many of the students here might identify with something that I'm going to talk about right now. When we sit in a classroom and we're spacing out, and I hope no one is spacing out right now, we find ourselves doodling in our textbooks, subconsciously, the first set of patterns that come forth. That was no different as a student, spacing out every so often. But years later, after reading Nangeli's story, I found myself with a purpose for the doodling that I would indulge in. I decided that I would doodle women back into history textbooks. So with that, my Instagram art project was born. And I chose to call it Fem Encyclopedia because I was all about feminizing encyclopedias that had already been captured by history. And in that process, the journey of discovery was tremendous. The kind of stories, the kind of women, the kind of contributions that I stumbled upon leave me stunned and amazed even today and bring tears to my eyes. The world knows of DNA as a discovery by Watson and Crick. They even won a Nobel Prize for it. But without the contributions of Rosalind Franklin, who sat and studied diffractions in an X-ray, they wouldn't have done it. They couldn't have done it. And yet Rosalind Franklin is that forgotten little footnote in some history textbooks, or that invisible woman completely ignored in every narrative that Watson and Crick have. The American Red Cross was founded by Clara Barton, a woman. But here's an interesting aspect of her story. Before she founded the American Red Cross, she had found that there were so many problems in the American education system in the 19th century. And all by herself, she raised $4,000 in the 19th century. She constituted a board for the school that she was about to set up. The board was made of men, and they replaced her for being a woman. We all know Sarojini Naidu as a poet, as the nightingale of India. And most of our history textbooks continue to leave her with just these two epithets. But how many of us actually know that India has successfully been the first among few nations in the world where men and women gain voting rights at the same time. How many of us know that a woman also walked the salt march and made salt in defiance of the British tax on salt? 
That woman was Sarojini Naidu. Nangeni, of course. Femme Cyclopedia would be incomplete without a tribute to her and all that she did as an act of resistance. Noor Inayat Khan is a name that's completely lost in any narrative of the Second World War. She was a spy, taking on all kinds of disguises, all kinds of appearances that never for a second betrayed her true identity, all to support the Allies and take on the SS. In the end, she was tortured, tortured right until the very minute, but she never for a second gave up on any of the sides that she was supporting. Rosa Parks, when we talk of the civil rights movement in the United States, the first name, and perhaps oftentimes the last name, is Martin Luther King. But Rosa Parks was that incendiary flame that set fire to that whole movement, refusing to alight the bus in Montgomery. She decided that she was not going to take segregation anymore. How many of us walk past the cottage arts emporiums in our cities? ignoring the true narrative behind it? How many of us take pride in the artistry and the craftsmanship that our tribal side of our country has exhibited? The reason that those arts, those crafts, they thrive in the way that they do was Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay. A child bride in the early 1900s, she was widowed and defied every norm that society imposed on child widows, no. left home, and moved to the Madras presidency, where she was a freedom fighter, standing shoulder to shoulder with every man of her times. Mekateli Wamenza, a woman who took on the Britons at a time when Kenya was coming under colonial rule. Single-handedly, she let her entire community rise up, led them eventually to success, while the British tried to burn down her entire village. I could go on and on. I could take you through narratives that could leave you with tears or as stunned as I am, even as I recount these true stories. And so every day, I make it a commitment to tell one story of one woman from across the ages, then, now, across seven continents, then, now. At first, it was a project out of selfishness. The goal was to be able to understand and learn more stories for myself. And in doodling these women back, somewhere I felt that their stories would be inscribed in the inside of my mind. But the most empowering narrative of all came to me a week ago as a message in my Instagram account, where a young girl told me that a doodle of a woman who came from her community and her story helped her open her parents' eyes up to the truth that she deserves to be educated, that she deserves to chase the career dreams that she had harbored for a very long time. Reading the story of that woman who was otherwise erased in history, her parents realized what they were about to do by depriving her of a shot at education, simply because she was a girl. On some levels, I dream of a day where Femcyclopedia Femme would no longer be needed, where the erasure of women would not be such an easy strategy in the histories that we write. And until then, I will keep doodling. Thank you. <laughs>